So with that, the technical announcement is over. And now let me first introduce our two distinguished guests today. Uh, in the order of uh, this, uh, the speakers, uh, first speaker of uh, today is uh, Ms. Yumi Araki. Thank you very much for joining us today. She is the multi-platform storyteller and journalist with experience in print, uh, video, and radio. Uh, her, her bio, which is um, extraordinary, let me read it out. Uh, Ms. Yumi Araki is currently the senior producer at America's Test Kitchen podcast, Proof. She was previously the senior producer and editorial lead at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, of course, the, the very famous US-based think tank, a producer for NPR's On Point with Tom Ashbrook, a daily call-in news program, and a reporter for the Yomiuri Shimbun, the, the largest newspaper in Japan. She has also produced a number of documentaries on topics including Japanese culture, climate change, and the U.S. Space Force. Uh, Yumi Araki-san, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and uh, for the second speaker, we have uh, Ambassador Bilahari Kalsikan, uh, who is the chairman of the Middle East Institute, uh, which is an, an, an Autonomous Institute of National University of Singapore. He has spent his entire career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. During his 37 years in the ministry, he served in a variety of appointments at home and abroad, including as ambassador to the Russian Federation, permanent representative to the UN in New York, and as the permanent secretary to the ministry. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Kazikhan, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. And now uh, that the introduction is done, we would like to uh, move on to the first half of this, meet, uh, this uh, conference, uh, this session, uh, which is uh, the opening speech uh, from keynote speech uh, from Ms. Araki-san and then uh, followed by the Q&A session. So um, if uh, Araki-san is ready, we would like to start off uh, with your session. Araki-san, please. All right, thank you very much. Uh, forgive me for one second. I'm just trying to share my screen here. Um, there we go. Is everybody able to see this? Yes, thank you very much. Wonderful. All right, so I'll get started. Um, I appreciate the invite uh, to speak to this esteemed group. Um, just <laughs> a heads up that this is more of a um, uh, sort of my reflections on on storytelling um, that I've done sort of globally more so than a speech, um, but hopefully it incorporates, you know, some things that um, you might be interested in and some of the storytelling um, that I've done. So um, hopefully it will be a bit more interactive as we go along. Um, so yeah, uh, great to see everybody here. Um, I want to just uh, thank Jem for inviting me uh, in particular, and also a special shout out, shout out to um, SIPA. Uh, I took a lot of classes there when I was finishing my master's at the um, Graduate Journalism School at Columbia, so um, glad to see folks there too. Um, and I appreciate it. It's a Friday night, so all right. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, thank you for that kind of introduction. Um, I guess, you know, uh, what I've done has already been um, described, but, um, you know, I'm the producer of Proof, which is a podcast about, um, it's about food, but it's more about the humanity around food. So if you think This American Life, but about food. Um, and I've done documentaries um, and also uh, sort of straight news. So I run the gamut of, of having covered a lot of things. And um, in my storytelling endeavors, uh, I've come to see some patterns um, and how narratives, wh whether they're, you know, policy memos, uh, pieces of journalism, or whatever sort of type of narrative, right? What I mean by that is just the types of stories that are being told. Um, they reflect the tenor of the times um, and, the and they change the way we talk about other countries. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the patterns that I've uh, noticed. Um, and at the end, I'm going to sort of pose a rhetorical question to see if there isn't another approach to what I've been seeing um, about our world in the context of globalization, as I know that that's sort of the theme of, of the keynotes here. Um, just a warning, I'm going to move very, very quickly through time um, and make sort of sweeping generalizations about certain eras. Uh, but um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm trying to sort of uh, summarize a lot of stuff in uh, the, over the course of three decades or so. So just as a warning there. 
All right, so we begin in the late 80s um, and the early aughts, uh, and, or, and that's the, you know, the early 2000s, um, not just because that's when I was born um, slash became sentient, but uh, it's also because when I would argue when globalization really became a force that was talked about in narratives a lot, um, right? So um, at the end of the Cold War, uh, we see um, a lot of uh, news reports about the Berlin Wall tumbling down and, you know, the, the tr triumph against uh, communism, if you will. Um, a lot of imagery about, you know, the world opening up is coming into play. Um, and you see that also, for, for example, this New York Times um, front page story, you know, East Germany opens frontier to the West for emigration or visits, thousands cross. Again, this image of uh, intercrossing and, you know, going outwards and, and intermingling in ways that we hadn't ever before. Um, and even to the point in 1995 where, you know, we're even, um, you know, having exchanges with who, what used to be our enemies. And I realize that this is a very sort of American-centric way, but I think the, the notion of the West meeting and opening up the world to other countries was, was a predominant narrative, right? U.S. space shuttle docks with Russian space station. Um, and I think in this story, uh, the NASA administrator at the time, Daniel Golden says, um, it's a new era of friendship and cooperation, right? So this notion of internationalization is very positive um, and sort of seeing globalization as a force that opens the aperture to the rest of the world. Um, what does that mean on an institutional level? It means that, um, you know, countries and organizations are, are globalizing as well, right, and heading into a more sort of um, multilateral framework. So, you know, whether that means the China formally entering the WTO, um, it's about formalizing and um, creating um, uh, strategies and sort of, sort of similar ways to approach global pro problems, right? Um, and if you read some of these articles, a lot of the tenor is sort of, oh, you know, the dawn of democracy, democracy has, has come and we want to bring um, countries that are in the dark along with us so they can experience the same um, wealth and, um, you know, sort of capitalism and, and systems that will help the rest of the world. Um, so, you know, WTO, China's WTO commitment will diminish state-run monopolies and force Chinese companies to respond. Again, this is a very sort of optimistic tenor. That extends to um, not just on the institutional sort of country to country level, but also people to people level, right? Um, you start seeing a lot of books and, and this is just an extension of the interest in China, for example. Um, this is a New York Times uh, book review about a memoir by this guy who um, went to China on, on his Peace Corps assignment. Um, and, you know, he describes you know, what it was like on the ground. And so you start to see a lot of narratives that are diving deep into the countries that um, the West or the US, you know, go towards and open up per se, quote unquote. Um, so he describes, you know, um, uh, Hessler is disturbed by the constant politicization of things in China, the banned topics, the rote learning, the reflexive patriotism that often crosses the border into chauvinism. Now, I would argue and summarize that a lot of the narratives that are happening around this time are about other countries are optimistic, again, because of the tenor of globalization and opening up, but they are a little bit condescending, um, especially as it pertains to um, uh, not just Western, but in particular American um, narratives about other countries, right? In, in Underneath all of these headlines and the between the lines is sort of look at these people who we've enlightened um, and let's like, you know, learn a little bit more about them, right? So that's, I'm not saying that that's, that was the case all throughout, but that is the general tenor that was there. Um, so then we're skipping ahead a lot. So this is late 80s into the early 2000s. I argue that, you know, 9-11 really provided a pivot point um, to and disrupted this narrative of, yes, globalization is great and it's opening us up to the world. Um, it was a pivotal moment where uh, there's a reckoning really that the Western globalization, or not just Western, but globalization, you know, doesn't open all nations, right? As a matter of fact, more exposure to different countries emphasizes the difference between them. 
Um, and, and this is very you know, evident in sort of the Christian world versus the Muslim Midwest world. So you start seeing a lot of um, narratives and headlines now that underscore sort of the differences, right? Um, this is about President Bush and his um, State of Union address where he talks about um, and, and coins the axis of evil term. Um, he points to North Korea, Iran, Iraq um, as sort of states and, and starts separating away from the multilateral framework into, well, but these, these guys are different from us. Um, as a cascading effect, you have um, countries in the Mideast having to sort of defend themselves because of the narratives that have been built around them. So Yemen struggles to shake off history of nurturing extremism and terrorism. Um, you see the same thing um, in Bali, right? Uh, they're trying to reassure tourists that the island is still is, you know, is safe and um, we're, we're not, you know, housing terrorists here, things like that. And this also has a backwards effect um, in a way, a reflexive effect on how the rest of the world starts uh, reporting on the US and the West. So this is um, from the World Policy Journal in uh, 2004 or five, that's the issue. Um, and it's, it's pointing a fairly critical eye on uh, George W. Bush as he's entering his second term. Um, and again, so that again is creating fissures in the narrative towards unity and, and that you know, globalization is actually you know, just the, the greatest thing in the world kind of thing. Um, all right, so skipping ahead, um, another pivotal point then is in my mind, just because I covered the 2016 elections, but is, is 2016. Um, I would argue that this fissure began happening like probably in 2012 or something like that. But um, especially as we enter into the Trump administration, right? Um, and you see the rise of populism hap happening across the world this narrative of globalization um, and the powers and the merits of it are somewhat um, portrayed as no longer in vogue. Um, there's, a, there's a huge pessimism that, that's sort of surrounding the issue and you begin to see headlines, and this is actually quite recent, you know, global outbreak is fueling the backlash to globalization. Um, you begin to see um, narratives that sort of look at countries as having their own essential qualities that are somewhat irreconcilable with others. So, you know, this Times article is like, you know, will American ideas tear France apart? Some of its leaders think so. Um, and, and underpinning that is the notion that, you know, oh, well, Americans just think differently from French and from the French. And, you know, we don't want these ideas being contaminating our system that works for us. Um, and, at, and at, on a larger scale, as it pertains to globalization, um, you have you know, authors like Michael O'Sullivan talking about, um, instead of this uh, multilateral approach, right? It's, it's becoming much more sort of multipolar. So rather than having um, you know, unified systems around um, the same notion of democracy, you have even within that large bubble sort of uh, fa factions starting to break down. Um, and he sort of articulates this as, um, you know, the essence of multipolarity is not simply that the poles are large and powerful, but also that they develop distinct cultural consistent ways of doing things. And again, underlying that is the notion that, and, and therefore it's hard for countries to come up with standards um, and their irreconcilable differences that uh, create fissures. And so underneath all of that, you know, what does it say about narratives about different countries? Well, it veers into this essentialistic, multipolar, multipolar um, underscoring uh, tone. Um, so that's sort of where we are at the moment um, uh, through my experience. I, I think though in 2021, and especially this is acutely the case um, after the Trump administration, were, I think sort of globally at a different place. You know, I don't think we're as um, uh, cynical about globalization as, you know, let's say 20, um, well, certainly 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, 
And, you know, I think there's a real opportunity now as we've entered this, as, you know, O'Sullivan would say, the after globalization or post globalization, there's a real opportunity to really examine how we produce narratives um, and how we write our papers, how we uh, report our stories to create a more um, nuanced lens about the world and not be as reflexive. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if people are familiar with this GIF, it might just be um, a US and, and UK thing, but um, what I'm trying to argue and suggest is that there's a way to take lessons from all of the different narrative frameworks from the three sort of big chunks of eras that I've discussed and incorporate them into our line of thinking when we, when we create narratives. So, you know, I think we should be thinking more about having this sense of optimism when we approach the subject of globalization, but without condescension, obviously, like we don't want to um, alienate other countries and otherize them as, as you know, uh, narratives did in the past. I think it's good to be reasonably critical about, you know, what our differences are, what our similarities are, and, and approach it with um, a very critical eye. Um, and I think, you know, understanding the essential qualities that make up certain countries or the way that their policies are run um, is important. And, and it's really key to understand that in order to understand the nuances of differences between countries. But it's also, um, you know, you can have that while also being nuanced about what the similarities are between countries and, you know, getting over the notion that like maybe they're not irreconcilable. Right. And I think this kind of thinking is especially important now because uh, with with global climate change happening, with the coronavirus happening, um, these take global solutions. It's not something that country A can just do and then country B can ignore. Right. So I'm hoping that we can imbue some of this um, more sort of nuanced uh, approach to storytelling as we go forward. And, you know, just to look at my own work that I've done, um, this was a story that I did on immigration uh, for the Yomiuri Shimbun uh, ahead of the 2016 elections. You know, uh, we interviewed this family and my framework as I approached this was, well, immigration is a big hot topic. You know, um, candidate Trump is super anti-immigration. Um, it must be really tough uh, for a family like this to be entering the U.S. at a time like this. and. Um, you know, this was a Syrian refugee uh, from Aleppo and, you know, I was, we were sort of interviewing him and it turns out that, yes, you know, he has a very specific experience that um, may or may not be relatable just because of the, the terror that he went through and having to immigrate from Aleppo to Turkey to North Carolina uh, in the U.S. But at the end of the day, you know, what he really wanted was something that's very universal, just you know, a, a good future for his daughter. Um, he used to be a tailor in Aleppo. So, um, you know, wanted wanted to eventually be able to open his own um, sewing shop in North Carolina. And in a way it was unremarkable, like his dreams were unremarkably not essentialized to who he was as a Syrian refugee. And so being able to see the difference, I think, um, and the similarities, uh, I, I wish I had imbued a lot of that nuance um, in that story, which I didn't do. Same thing, you know, with disinformation, um, a lot, especially in the US, the context was put in, you know, oh, the Russian disinformation campaign is ruining um, and jeopardizing the US election, right? Um, and you saw a lot of headlines like this. When in reality, disinformation was happening um, you know, I would argue that yes, the 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 hard or the most uh, prominent example was probably the U.S. elections, but it was also happening in Brazil, um, India, um, uh, North Korea, and um, Hungary, and everywhere. And so it was not just an isolated sort of incidence of this is happening in the U.S. between Russia and the U.S., but also uh, you know globally. Um, and as a result, I think that the narratives were slow to catch up on that idea. And as a result, I think did, did some damage. Um, in my own work, uh, this was a, a four part series that I did. I hosted um, for Singapore's national broadcaster. This is an episode about work. Uh, 
Um, and in the interest of time, I probably won't play the entire clip, but essentially we did a section about how, um, you know, work in Japan, like there, there's a term called karoshi, right? You work so hard until you die or get sick. Um, and we talk a little bit about why the Japanese sort of bushido mentality might have contributed to that, right? So being very um, dedicated to your work to, the, to a fault. Well, you know, the same could be argued. Uh, and while there, there are very sort of essential Japanese um, characteristics to that effect, one could argue that the same thing is happening um, across the world, you know, um, just in my own experience, like maintaining work-life balance is really, really difficult. Um, or it used to be very difficult for me in my previous job. And, you know, uh, there's some archival footage here um, where, well, let me, let me just play this With a little Japan's bit. economy facing its worst crisis since World War II, it seems work has become the be all and end all for many people. The relationship between employer and employee in Japan has traditionally been for life. Since the 1950s, Japanese businesses have hired recruits fresh out of school, trained them on the job, and kept them until retirement. Right, and it continues on, right? But the same could be, you could replace this footage, for example, with um, you know American workers in the 1950s and what GM and Ford was able to offer them. And this sense of lifetime service is inculcated um, when, you, when you employ people for life, right? So all that to say, there are um, things that make work essential or the, the phenomena of overwork uh, particular and, and germane to the Japanese experience, but this is a global problem. And this can be said also, we did an episode about aging and, you know, the aging problem is serious in Japan, but in 20 years, 30 years, um, many other developed countries will be facing sort of the same thing. Um, and so it's not just necessarily a Japanese problem. With Japan's economy oh, facing its work. All right, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so, you know, all this to say what I've observed in my time telling or editing stories is that, again, while there are essential differences between cultures and, um, you know, the way we describe other countries sort of reflects what's happening um, in the background, I think there's, there's space to be much more nuanced about it and not as reflexive. Um, and again, by incorporating sort of the three, you know, um, uh, types of frameworks from the three different eras that I mentioned, you know, uh, emphasizing differences, but also, you know, looking at the similarities and, and being critical about those two things. I think more of that can be imbued into policy research, um, journalism, whatever it is that we, um, that we do in our work to create narratives about how our world operates, you know, what, what's happening in our world and how countries and people interact with it together. Um, and I don't know if anybody uh, out there are Peloton um, instructors, but as I was doing this Lunar New Year ride with Emma Lovewell, what she said, I think <laughs> sums up what I'm trying to say really well. So just humor me and apologies um, if you don't like Peloton. We're more like it. And we can also celebrate our differences. <laughs> Familiarity is the key to acceptance. That's it. So <laughs> with that, oh my goodness. With that, I will, I'd be happy to take questions. Well, thank you very much, Arik-san. Uh, that was uh, very inspiring. And also I, I really liked that, uh, the last video as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much. So now we would like to move on to the Q&A session. And thank you very much for uh, your generosity of your time, Araki-san. And uh, how the Q&A session works, um, let me remind you again. So please use the raise the hands uh, function, uh, which you can find at the bottom of, of, the, um, of your screen. And if you have a question, please press that so that we can locate you and then ask you to speak. Um, and uh, you can also use the Q&A function, uh, which you can type in your question and then I can uh, try to read it out. Or uh, if uh, 
if you do want to talk, uh, please uh, raise your hands uh, at the same time so that I can point you uh, there. And we actually already have one question at the Q&A function, uh, which is from uh, Edward Paris. Um, I will try to unmute you, but do you want, can you talk now? If not, I can read out your questions. Yes, I can ask the question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, Yumi. Um, so I'm, I'm currently working in, in San Francisco in the Silicon Valley area. And I was wondering, my question is actually, um, working here in San Francisco, I work with my colleagues in Maritime Southeast Asia, and uh, we've been collaborating a lot around social entrepreneurial endeavors and how we could collaborate and, and share information. Um, do you feel the narrative of globalization today is moving away from the nation state model to non-state actors like myself and my colleagues in Southeast Asia as we are reaching out to each other in terms of sharing knowledge and looking for opportunities in the near future to co collaborate. So I, I wanted to hear your thoughts about that, Yubi, and thank you for taking my question. Sure, Edward, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and yeah, something that I think a lot um, these days, especially, you're right in that I, I don't necessarily think that the nation state um, narrative or that framework has gone away per se, but I have begun to notice a lot more um, sort of your, your third tier, right? So it's nations, people, and then this third tier of sort of businesses and um, corporations, organizations taking more of a role of what traditionally used to be, um, you know, something that countries did. Um, so for example, you know, something, a story that I've seen recently that I think speaks a little bit to this is the way that Facebook uh, is having to sort of re-examine and govern itself, right? And creating sort of its own internal Supreme Court structure um, and, uh, you know, uh, and to just to back up, you know, the way that Facebook um, has impacted our world and the way that we, um, and, and how policymakers govern and think about, you know, how to police the web or, you know, whatever it is, it has an outsized um, impact on our lives than say any sort of nation state or, you know, military, what have you. And so you have players like that, I think, emerge um, and become, I don't want to say a substitute, but like is talked about in the framework traditionally how nation states used to be. Um, and so as it pertains to this particular story, you know, it's about how uh, Facebook is trying to sort of self-govern and create its own sort of governmental structure, if you will. Um, and, you know, that is inevitably at odds with, let's say, what the U.S. Constitution or, or, or laws um, are not at odds, but it butts up against sort of the traditional structures of governance, right? And it forces lawmakers to re reimagine, well, how does that then fit into our traditional structures of government and how we govern and understand how to create rules around certain things like information sharing. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I'm, I'm not sure if that quite answered your question, but I am seeing a trend more that, um, you know, and one could argue as global institutions like the WTO or, you know, um, the IMF or whatever, whatever they are, have begun to show um, a lack of nimbleness or inability to keep up with how quickly the pace of globalization is changing our world. I think you are starting to see um, people look for alternatives and there are alter that third party, you know, group step in to fill in some of those gaps. Um, and I, so I think, you know, certainly as it pertains to tech, like that's, that's a domain that I think you're gonna see more stories like that. Um, and um, certainly in the, in the, uh, sort of not social corporate responsibility world, but um, aid organizations, things like that. Um, and this new sort of era of social, socially responsible companies, I think are gonna get much more spotlights and um, take on the narrative that traditionally, you know, government run organizations are, you know, are, are spotlighted. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Wei Ern Lim Sun uh, raising uh, his hands. Um, if you could uh, speak. 
hope this works, but I'm asking you to unmute. Uh, probably we're having some technical difficulties, so maybe we can uh, ask you later. And uh, now we will ask uh, Dean Danny Quad. Uh, and uh, if you would like to show your video, I am upgrading you to the panel, so um, you can do so. If not, you could also try to unmute yourself so that you can speak. Thank you, Kotaro-san. Thank you I very much. Everyone can hear me now. Uh, thank you, Yumi, for for wonderful uh, uh, presentation. I want to pick up on your idea about why not both or all. That's an idea I think some of us in the audience are going to be likely personally very, very comfortable with. But there will be others, not just in this audience, but everywhere else, who, who might think of it as a bit idealistic. Some might say it's a bit naive about the world. Uh, so you know they they will they will think of ideas and systems as being so profoundly undermining of one another they cannot coexist. So in Cold War times, you know the st standard story was capitalism and communism. Today it's other things: technology, government intrusion, all the, the, the whole gamut of things. What in your experience as a journalist that travels the world? What do you see of the reality of really such fundamental inconsistencies in humanity's view on this? Or do you think these inconsistencies are really self-serving and artificial, constructed by, by political leadership who are looking out for themselves? Over to you, please. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I think there's several ways to answer this. But first of all, I think that um, and, and this always comes back to technology, but you know, social media has made um, being able to be more nuanced about the way we see the world difficult, right? Um, social media creates echo chambers. So even if we are trying to get a healthy dose of different types of uh, media from different types of organizations, um, the algorithm sometimes won't do that. Um, and so you know, your ideas then are just reinforced by what you had already agreed to before. Um, and so I think that's a real threat. Um, the other part of it that becomes difficult is depending on what medium we're talking about, right? When I say narratives, that can mean narratives in policy writing. It can mean narratives in broadcast journalism. It can mean narratives in uh, you know, different types of news. I think different mediums, um, not all mediums are created equally. And so nuance can get lost a lot, for example, in broadcast journalism, um, TV news, cable news. Um, also, the, the incentive isn't necessarily aligned with the, with the sort of lofty goal of journalism, which is to try to get people to understand the world better, whether that's the differences or the similarities, right? So I think that in and of itself is its own issue as well. Um, I, I, I'm a pessimist <laughs> as, as just generally. And so I, I very much understand and relate to the notion that this idea is naive. Um, I don't disagree with that at all. But I think, you know, where we can stop to think a little bit, especially if we're, you know, trying to build a project that is a people to people exchange, um, you know, initiative, like where can we think a little bit more about, um, uh, let's start with the differences and end with where we're, where those similarities tie in, right? Um, if it's journalism, to really check your own biases before you go and report on a country that you might be familiar with or, you know, but, but you're not a part of, that kind of thing. So I think it takes systematic effort by individuals, really, because I don't think a state can, can accomplish this, but by individuals to understand the biases that work against them and the systems that work against them and to really be to make a personal concerted effort to go outside of your comfort zone and step back and think okay have i considered all of the different you know what i feel like are irreconcilable differences like is that actually the case or is there something that we can start off with on a micro level and try to build up to something that's similar um so 
and, and that sounds naive also. I don't know the solution to how to do that on a, on a more systematic sort of um, bigger scale level. Um, but I suspect that it, uh, that it doesn't come from the government. It has to come from a different entity. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's hard to wrap my head around that because I don't, I, I just see the trend getting worse, um, not better, unfortunately, uh, but that's a great question. Well, thank you very much. Um, we would like to move on to the next question. Um, I have uh, a question at the Q&A function. And uh, this is a question from uh, Mr. Bagaz Putra. And it says, hi, Yumi-san. I never had in-depth experiences to engage in, investiga in investigative writings or journalistic style, but I have always wanted to contribute to global discourses about the current hot topics. At the moment, I'm pursuing my graduate degree at the University of Tokyo GRASP. And as a seasoned storyteller yourself, I would love to hear your opinion in regards to what we can do as amateurs in this department. That's, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, and I always um, give the advice of, even if you're not able to publish somewhere, just publish and, and just write, right? And then eventually you'll be able to try to find somewhere. I think for young um, sort of IR experts or, or folks wanting to get into that space, um, The Diplomat um, is a great website. Um, so it's sort of a combination of, um, it's a website about news, but also sort of policy analysis and, and in particular what's happening sort of in East Asia, um, although not exclusive to that. Um, that, uh, the, the mission of The Diplomat is to really cultivate younger, um, and not just young, but sort of writers in the policy space who maybe don't have as much experience. And so, you, you know, you're usually paired with an editor who's experienced. Um, and so I encourage you to try to pitch them. And, you know, as it pertains to, oh, I have an idea and I want to put it out in the world, especially if you're trying to get it published at a blog or, um, you know, foreign policy, whatever, is to be really, really specific and also do your research around what's already been written about the subject before. Um, that sounds fairly like self-explanatory, but you'd be <laughs> surprised how many pitches I get about stories, you know, um, about things that already been written before or have, um, you know, already been produced. And so, you know, if you have an idea about something, um, for your own, you know, even if you don't get it published eventually, I think in order to, to add value to the discourse, it's, it's to find how your work or your idea or your approach is separate from the stuff that already exists. Um, so that's sort of the real advice that I would give. Um, and then practically beyond the diplomat, I'm just kind of, I'm wondering, you know, Medium is also a great um, platform. Um, so it's just sort of this uh, all-inclusive um, uh, information sharing platform and there's different channels, right? So there's um, a medium channel for just political stuff and, you know, articles from the New York Times, Politico, The Atlantic and BBC, things like that are posted on there, but also from personal sort of contributors. And so um, that's a great place to pitch. Um, and yeah, and I think, again, being specific and different and when you do go to, to email an, uh, an editor and say, you know, I have a story and I'd love to, you know, publish this on your website, again, being uh, separating yourself from what already exists and then being specific about what it is that you want to uh, say, I think is really important. Well, thank you very much. Um, as an amateur uh, myself, I, I try to uh, publish some articles and it is kind of scary when you put out your name there, but uh, you encouraged me to do that as well. So thank you very much. And now we have another question at the Q&A function, which is from the anonymous um, uh, person. And it says, how do you feel the media landscape and journalism has changed as a whole over the course of your career? And maybe to add to that question, uh, this is my question, but uh, because you work for the Yomi Yuri Shimbun, um, which is the well, traditional part of the, uh, the media, um, how do you feel, uh, what is the role of the traditional media? If um, um, there, I think, especially in Japan, uh, there's still a lot of roles uh, to play, but uh, if you could uh, answer to that question as well, that would be appreciated. Sure. 
So it's hard to uh, make sweeping generalizations about, you know, the entire media landscape, but, you know, on a, on one level, I think it has democratized a lot. So again, you're beginning, uh, you know, it used to be the case that there are, you know, three or four major newspapers and three or four major news um, channels. Um, and now there's sort of a proliferation of news websites or, um, you know, outlets where, where people can, you know, report the news in a non-traditional way. Um, and for the most part, I think that's been, that's been good if you are discerning and bad if you are not. Um, and of course, what I mean by if you are not is the people who read Breitbart or, um, you know, um, to a certain extent, Fox News. Um, Channel 4 things, Reddit, and, and you know, just rely on those things for news. It, it's, it's, not, it's not great. Um, but it has democratized. And I think the way, at least in the U.S. media, um, organizations like Vox News or, um, you know, uh, different news organizations that are still um, quite prominent, but are not, but are outside of sort of the institutional um, titles. I think those organizations have really pushed the traditional newspapers and media outlets to re-examine how they approach what truth is and what objectivity is. So in that sense, I think it's been really good because, um, you know, especially in the U.S., and, I, and maybe this is germane to the U.S., but, um, you know, a lot of journalism you're learned in journalism school, for example, to be objective and, you know, to tell both sides of the story. Well, I think what that means and what it means to tell both sides of the story has, has changed, right? It, you're creating false equivalencies when you are talking about climate change and then you interview a climate change uh, scientist and then the other person is like a flat earth believer, right? Those are not you're not actually comparing and contrasting two different ideas. Um, well, I mean, they are different ideas, but it's creating false equivalencies. So, you know, again, to say that the more non-traditional media outlets, I think have pushed the New York Times, the Wall Street Journals to think more critically about that approach. So I think in that way, that's been good. Um, as it pertains to an outlet like Yomiuri Shimbun or um, one of the more, you know, traditional, Journalism in, in Japan, I think, is a whole different ballgame as well, and I suspect that this is the case. I mean, it's hard to make generalizations about journalism at large globally because, um, and I, I'm like the the victim of my own sort of like I'm not following my own advice to try to find similarities. But um, in Japan, you know, it, it's a closed. I would say that it's it's not as open um, as it is in the U.S. or the U.K. Um, Yomiri Shimbun in particular, and, and I wouldn't say the day-to-day -day daily reporting is affected, but, you know, uh, when you get into the editorial pages and things like that, there are connections to powerful people in government that leadership doesn't want to um, provoke, and so you maybe omit something um, hypercritical, or, you know, you only publish the story that's critical about, you know, the Abe administration, or, um, you know, uh, who, whoever in the LDP until your competing paper has already produced a story. So you can say, well, they did it first and we're just catching up. Right. Um, so I think there's still barriers to truth telling in ways that are subtle um, in Japan, um, but um, it's hard to diagnose because there's sort of like systemic, um, mm, how do I describe it? They're, they're not things that, I mean, there are things that a watchdog can identify and say, you need to do a better job, but uh, it, it involves much more dismantling of, of traditional notions of power, um, which is hard to change overnight. I suspect, you know, the same um, phenomena happens in other sort of, you know, I, I know, uh, I, I know some sort of, you know, South Korean reporters say the same thing sometimes about reporting in South Korea. Um, the Philippines is a whole different story, um, you know. So, in that sense, it's hard to just try to universalize or, or compare. Well, you know, in the U.S., it's so free. Like, why can't you know other countries be like that? Well, it's a little bit more involved than that because the power structures are different, right? Um, 
Although I, I, I have to say and caveat this by saying like I predominantly worked out of the Washington DC Bureau for the Yomi Odishi Moon. So I don't personally have experience um, reporting as a daily journalist in Japan. Um, but I do know from colleagues that, you know, it can be a very insular sort of, you know, old boys club too and things like that. So the, the barriers are definitely there. Um, how to go about changing this, I think, will involve um, real structural change, right? I think it requires younger people to, um, and people who are more daring to enter the newspaper workforce, but it's hard to do because, you know, the pipeline of getting into and becoming a correspondent is still so institutionalized. And so you have to start from that really to, to dismantle that system. Um, but yeah, I mean, getting back to, you know, how I think journalism is changing as a whole. I mean, I still think it's getting better, um, but perhaps the ways that it's getting worse kind of some, sometimes outweigh the ways that it's getting better. Um, so, you know, all that to say, I think as, as news consumers, like it just, it, it unfortunately falls on us to become much more discerning about how we get our news. Well, thank you very much for your insightful uh, comments. Thank you. Um, now we have uh, hands raised by uh, Kaoru Nagasawa, who is with uh, SIPA. And thank you very much for tuning in from New York. And uh, I will ask you to unmute. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you, um, Ms. Araki. Uh, I am Kaoru Nagasawa. I am currently studying at Columbia SIPA. So I'm um, so glad to see you here as um, Columbia alumni. Thank you for your presentation. So uh, my question is about um, globalization. So um, you introduced as um, some narratives, the changes of narratives and Meanwhile, I thought you have interviewed so many people from different cultures and backgrounds. And I'm wondering if you saw any differences between the narratives and the people, the uh, voices of the ground. Um, so for example, um, I'm wondering if you, um, so did the people you interviewed have the same idea as narratives such as essentialism or multipolarity, or did they have totally different ideas toward globalization? Thank you. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. It's hard because, um, you know, it really depends on the type of person that you end up interviewing, right? So for instance, um, if it's talking to um, Danny Russell, who is the former Deputy Secretary of um, East Asian Affairs at the State Department, I think our, our ideas about globalization and where the, where the world stands would have been pretty similar, um, just because the lens in which I was reporting that interview or that story would have been talking about, you know, what's happening in East Asia, East Asian policy, um, where you think it's headed, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, as somebody who follows global affairs, it would be strange, I think, if, if my conception were very different from Danny Russell's, for example. Um, so in that sense, no, I don't think that sense of globalization departs so much from the people that I'm interviewing. It's really when I interview um, people that aren't policy people, people that aren't government people, um, just really, you know, quote unquote, everyday people is when um, I feel that, you know, they, they approach globalization and globalism in a very different way. So um, I'm trying to think of, okay, so when I was, you know, interviewing folks on the ground um, in Southern states for the 2016 presidential election, which I did for Yomiuri Shimbu, you know, the correspondents always wanted to, um, tell stories about, oh, you know, Southern people are conservative and, you know, they tend to vote, vote Republican and they're afraid of outsiders and they're usually anti-immigration. And so, you know, we'd create this notions in our head for, pro, for profile A of, you know, 
Southern voter A, essentially. But then when you would go on the ground and talk to them, um, sometimes their answer would, answers would be much more nuanced. So if you ask them about immigration, right, like what are your stances on immigration, they would be like, well, you know, I'm against it, but it's principally because, you know, my husband who used to work in a union position, um, uh, he's now laid off and then, or, or he used to work in a factory and, and he's now laid off because there's suddenly this influx of you know, Eastern Europeans who came to our, our town and, um, you know, because they get paid lower and, and, you know, factories can get away with paying lower to immigrants, like, you know, the, the uh, wages have gone down. So like my husband, like, can't, doesn't want to work there anymore and they want to work elsewhere. And so it's not just about racism, right? So for me, like going into this, I was like, well, this probably, this person probably doesn't like immigration because they're racists, <laughs> but it's not as simple as that, right? Um, and so I, I encounter things like that all the time where I think the, the, you know, the narrative that's been created around certain people, groups of people or, or interest groups is such, but then when you actually talk to them, it, it's, it's a bit more, uh, there's more to it. Um, another um, example is, um, you know, when I did my documentary on um, climate change and how three different um, communities in, in Kenya, El Salvador, and Nepal were, um, you know, trying to adapt to the climate change that was happening very drastically in their communities. Um, they didn't, you know, they didn't see it as like, well, this is part of climate change and you know we we as a population like have to do uh, everything we can to mitigate it it's more about how do we preserve the legacy of our people um how do we uh, and of course it's not like they're not thinking about the globalization part of it but it's it's you know their adaptation strategies are much more about personal survival and preservation of um, you know, their own people and therefore so that the rest of the world can also thrive, right? So it's a, it's a secondary thing. So in that way, yeah, there are slight differences um, and they make me, they're very humbling experiences for me because they check my own biases about, you know, the narratives that I subscribe to um, and they challenge them a lot. Um, and so I, I, that, that's a great question. And I imagine that that kind of thing will, might happen you know, when you're interviewing people for policy papers and things like that too, right? Um, I think it happens everywhere. Thank you very much. Um, we are close to um, the end of the expected uh, time, but uh, I did see some hands uh, risen, but uh, uh, which kind of disappeared. So maybe we're having some technical difficulties. If so, we apologize, but if there's no any hands risen, um, now I would like to conclude uh, her session and maybe um, Anaki-san, if you have any final uh, message to the students or any comments, uh, if you could uh, give us some encouraging statements, that would be great. Sure, of course. I'm just going to share uh, the last <laughs> sort of funny screen of mine again. Um, it has my website and um, my Twitter and my LinkedIn. Um, you know, sometimes these sort of larger panels can be a bit <laughs> intimidating and I'm always happy to chat with you one on one through one of these channels. Um, you know, you all are very esteemed, very, very <laughs> smart people who are steeped in policy sort of probably much more than I am. So as it pertains to sort of, um, you know, specific global issues, you probably have better insight, but as it pertains to how that manifests in journalism, or how um, it, it manifests in media, you know, I'd be happy to chat with you about it. And also just, you know, pitching um, uh, ideas or whatever it is. Um, and then if I can just make <laughs> a personal plug. Um, so the, the podcast that I work on, Proof, um, again, it's about, the episodes are about uh, stories about humanity and food. And I'm always looking for unique um, angles and things like that uh, to tell stories about food. So if you have an idea, um, feel free to ping me as well. Um, I'm always just trying to change the format of the show as well. Um, and, you know, I think the ideas and, and to make the show much more global because right now it's fairly US centric. Um, so if you have an idea, shoot it my way. Um, and yeah, I'd love, love to connect with everyone.
Well, with that, thank you very much, Arik-san. And uh, you, sp you inspired us a lot. So thank you very much again. Uh, we cannot see the audience, but I'm sure they are uh, clapping their hands. And uh, please give a round of applause to um, Ms. Yuri, uh, uh, Yumi Araki. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you, you very much. My honor. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we would like to move on to the second half of uh, this session, which is a keynote address by Ambassador Bilahari Kausikan, and followed by a Q&A session. Um, um, sorry for uh, being repetitive, but let me uh, uh, read out uh, the bio of uh, Ambassador Bilahari Kausikan, although all of you may know. Uh, Ambassador Bilahari Kausikan is currently the chairman of the Middle East Institute and an autonomous uh, Institute of the National University of Singapore. He has spent his entire career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. During his 37 years in the ministry, he served in a variety of appointments at home and abroad, including as ambassador to the Russian Federation, permanent res representative to the UN in New York, and as the permanent secretary to the ministry. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your patience, Ambassador, and uh, uh, the stage is yours. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'll get straight to it because I want to leave as much time for questions and answers so that this can be a dialogue rather than a monologue. Uh, the question you set for me, or rather I set for myself, is whether globalization is in crisis. Well, globalization is undoubtedly under stress, but do the pressures, the tensions, the internal contradictions that are clearly confronting globalization amount to a crisis. To my mind, that's not so clear, and this is not just a matter of semantics. In the Analex, Confucius said, and I quote, if names be not correct, language is not in accordance with the truth of things. If language be not in accordance with the truth of things, affairs cannot be carried on to success, end of quote. A crisis is a very loaded term. <clears throat> In common usage, it has two meanings. First, a time of intense difficulty or danger. And second, a turning point. For example, if you hear a doctor saying, the patient's fever has reached a crisis, you know the patient's condition will either get better or worse. In other words, it will change, it won't remain the same. And these two meetings, therefore, imply a third meaning or a third, have a third implication. And that is that a crisis carries itself in itself, the seeds of, or at least the probability of, some sort of resolution. I said resolution, not solution. Huh? Now, please keep this third implication of the word crisis in mind because it lies at the center of my conclusions. I'm not sure that any of, that any of, mean, of these meanings of crisis is the most appropriate way of describing the, the current state of globalization. In the age of the internet, in the age of social media, there is an unfortunate tendency to over-dramatize situations so as to gain attention at a time of information overload. This is unfortunate, but it can't be helped. I don't think we're going to be able to reverse this tendency. But I want to remind you that words do matter. The words we choose to describe a situation embed in them, whether we are conscious of it or not, a particular assessment or a particular diagnosis of the situation. And using the wrong word, can lead to a misdiagnosis and a misdiagnosis can lead to a wrong prescription and a wrong prescription can result in something worse than the original condition. Now let me get to, to globalization. The sources of the stresses that globalization is being subject to have two primary uh, sources. First of all, external, of which the most immediately obvious manifestations are the pandemic, and US-China strategic competition. And secondly, the domestic politics of key countries. I'll deal with each in turn, but first, a general observation. I, I would like you to bear in mind that globalization is not just an economic phenomenon, but also a cultural, and above all, a political phenomenon. Moreover, even considered as a purely economic phenomenon, the data available does not, to my mind, suggest that deglobalization of any magnitude is going on. There have been falls in international trade, dips may be a better word, dips in international trade and investment, and some changes in the patterns of trade and investment. But overall, the volumes of trade and investment remain quite high. 
I don't have time to go into all the figures, but if any of you are interested, please email me through the organizers who know my email and I'll send them to you. Now to the external factors. The disruptions to globalization that we have observed or experienced are not all due to the pandemic, nor can the stresses in US-China relations be held entirely responsible for them either. These factors, the pandemic and US-China relations, certainly accentuated dysfunctionalities and tensions that were evident before the pandemic, but they did not in themselves create the dysfunctionalities and tensions. And this suggests that the causes lie elsewhere. I'll return to this later, but for now, a few observations on the external factors. Globalization was characterized by a system of open international economic exchange and cooperation we have come to call the liberal international order. But this system, this liberal international order is not the natural state of the international system. The liberal order was internationally and domestically contested and often violently contested for more than 40 years during the Cold War. It was only a relatively it was only relatively uncontested for less than half that time, about 20 years or so from 1989 when the Berlin Wall came down to around 2008 when the global financial crisis broke out. And that's a, a historically short and exceptional period. And we are now back to a more historically normal situation where the liberal order is again domestically and internationally contested that those two exceptional decades when the liberal order was uncontested were very good ones for most of our countries, China included, should not blind us to this fact. It's not the natural order of things. US-China strategic competition will be a structural feature of international politics for the foreseeable future. But this is not, it is not a new Cold War, which is a historically inappropriate and intellectually lazy trope that distorts the essential nature of US-China competition. Why do I say that? Well, in principle, the US and the former Soviet Union each led two separate systems connected only tangentially. The essential common interest the US and the Soviet Union shared was to avoid mutual destruction. Their competition was over which system would prevail. But the US and China are both vital components of a single system and they are entangled in a web of supply chains of a scope, of a dentist, density, and of a complexity never before seen in the global economy. These supply chains distinguish the current type of inter interdependence from previous periods of interdependence. Neither the US nor China are particularly comfortable with this situation, and some fragmentation in specific domains has occurred, and these are among the pressures facing globalization as the US and China try to mitigate their vulnerabilities and hedge against overdependence on each other. But the very complexity of the supply chains, especially in the technology domain, and semiconductor supply chains, which are the main American focus because they are a major Chinese vulnerability, are particularly complex. Well, the complexity of the supply chains, the density, makes total across the board decoupling of the US and its friends and allies on China highly improbable, as improbable as China creating an entirely new alternative system or becoming totally self-reliant. Self and this has less limits to deglobalization. Furthermore, globalization is not self-organizing. It requires leadership. And leadership, to my mind at least, consists of two key attributes. First, strategic weight, by which I mean Military, first of all, military and economic hard and soft power. And you cannot have soft power without hard power and either soft or hard power alone is inadequate. You need both. And second, you need the will to lead in a particular way. Leading an open international system requires a leader that is prepared to be open. By this definition, there is going to be a serious deficit of international leadership for the foreseeable future. I don't see any major country or group of countries meeting both these conditions for leadership. For the foreseeable future, the US, despite the new administration, will be more transactional than in the past. China will remain essentially mercantilist, and the EU will lack both strategic weight and be too incoherent to be a global leader. 
And this brings me to the internal factors. I think the internal factors are far more fundamental in that to a very large extent, the external factors derive from them. Now in the West, the essential problem is the dysfunctionality of political systems. Western democracies, now Asian democracies are less, relatively less affected, but only relatively, have seemed to me to have lost sight of the fact that the fundamental purpose of any political system is to govern, that is to say, to deliver certain outcomes to the people under its, uh, its uh, rule. Instead, the stress seems to me to have shifted to processes. Democratic processes have too often become ends in themselves and political reform, if it is at all attempted, consists largely of making the processes more democratic, more representative, which often degrades their efficiency. All democratic systems are to some degree dysfunctional by design to prevent an over-concentration over of power. But this has gone too far in many democratic systems. It's clear that in the US and many European countries, it has become harder and harder to get anything meaningfully done, meaningful done through the political process, which at the same time makes ever greater demands on its participants. For this reason, very often the best minds in any country are not to be found among political leaders. It takes a rather special type of personality and not always an attractive one to willingly subject oneself to the stresses of a career uh, in a political career, among other things in which you have to accept almost a total loss of privacy, in which the ability to achieve meaningful outcomes is extremely uncertain and limited. Now, I'm not saying that Western democracies are bound to fail. I'm merely saying that the creativity and resilience of Western democracies rise, resides far more outside the political system and often despite the political system. For example, the most important things about the US, and this is a conclusion I came to uh, very soon after the first time I set foot into the US, which is sometime in the late 70s. The most important things about the US do not occur in Washington DC. And I hope my friends who work in Washington DC will forgive me for saying so. Washington DC is just not as important as in its self-absorbed way it thinks it is. The most important things in the US occur on Wall Street, on the main streets of the 50 states, in major corporations, in research laboratories, and in its great universities. And it was not always so, of course, but after stoically bearing the risks and exertions of the Cold War for 40 years or more, and enduring seemingly interminable wars in the Middle East since the beginning of the 2000s, Americans are no longer to lead in the same way. And America, ordinary Americans are no longer willing to trust their leaders in the same way. America is no longer prepared to be as generous or as open as it was. Mr. Trump was a symptom of underlying conditions that will persist long after he has been forgotten. And he's far from gone. After all, 74 million Americans voted for him and they will not all suddenly vanish. And Mr. Biden has to take that into account. For a long time to come, America's foremost priorities are going to be domestic, and hence US international leadership is going to be limited, although perhaps not quite as nakedly transactional as Mr. Trump's approach. America will be more polite and consultative, but essentially in the same direction. The root cause was the hubris that infected American and more generally Western policies in the immediate Cold War period. This led many Western leaders, and by leader I mean I include intellectuals and other opinion shapers, and not just political leaders, uh, to see the end of the Cold War not just as another, although major, geopolitical episode in a process that will continue as long as history itself, but to invest it with a far vaster significance than the event could bear. I don't have time to elaborate, we can perhaps take this up during question, but suffice to say that the delusion that the West had all the answers led to a growing gulf of values and concerns between Western leaders and substantial portions of their own peoples. And dazzled by the splendor of their own visions and values, Western political leaders neglected problems that were of immediate concern to their peoples. Foremost among them, changes in the structure of their economies and the consequent inequities wrought by globalization. Furthermore, the intrusion of the alien other into the lives of ordinary people with an immediacy unprecedented in history, 
compounded the economic grievances, even as the accelerating pace of change disoriented them. Well, the result is, as you know, populism, Brexit, you know, and, and so on. Now, nothing I have said is intended to suggest that authoritarian systems like China are any better off. Such systems may be better able to, to pursue long-term goals, but the political dilemmas China faces are no less fundamental than those of the West and indeed may well pose existential challenges to China. It's a complicated story and again, I don't have time to elaborate and I hope we can take this up during question time, but this is the short version. At the Chinese Communist Party's 18th Congress in 2012, China acknowledged that its current economic model was unsustainable. The following year, Beijing rolled out the outlines of a new model that envisaged a decisive role for the market in the allocation of resources. But implementation has been hesitant and limited. China has not abandoned the market, of course, but under Mr. Xi Jinping, the Chinese Communist Party has placed, placed far greater stress on party control and party discipline over all sectors of society, including the private sector, including private enterprises. The Chinese Communist Party has yet to decide how and how much more to open up and how to balance the Chinese Communist Party's political control with market efficiency and market efficiency almost by definition means less control and more political risk. And this is occurring in the, in the context of rising expectations of the Chinese people, growing inequality, uh, and the demographic pressures of an aging population. I think there's something of a vicious cycle developing in China in that to deal with these and other long-term problems requires resources. Continually replenishing resources over the long term requires continued growth. Continued growth requires a new model and a new model entails risks to the Chinese Communist Party's control and mitigating the risks requires growth and so on and so on. So far, Mr. Xi Jinping has not found the political will to break the cycle and Chinese policy has circled round rather than confronted this core issue. Furthermore, there are these are primary domestic concerns in which China's international engagements are intended to serve, giving its external policies a strong mercantilist cast in which the Chinese Communist Party's interests rather than international rules needed to uphold the order from which China has benefited is the primary consideration. Not surprisingly, China is not particularly trusted internationally. In fact, all recent polls show it is that drastic falls in the level of trust in China. And China suffers from a persistent deficit of soft power. All these issues ultimately stem from the nature of the Chinese polity. China is a communist country, not ideologically, but certainly in its political structure. And I see no prospect of that being modified in any substantive manner. And I don't think it should be modified because it's hard for me to see China being governed in any other way. Now, let me wrap up by drawing three conclusions from what I've just said. First, the current state of process, the messiness of globalization, the pressures and stresses under which globalization is, uh, is enduring. This current state of affairs is likely to be prolonged. The new American president will make some difference, but not a decisive difference. So too will the, an end to a pandemic, and sooner or later there will be an end to a, the pandemic, although when nobody can really predict, will also not make a decisive difference, although it will certainly ease certain aspects of the problems. There is no going back to a pre-pandemic or pre-Trumpian status quo ante. Nor should we imagine that the status quo ante was some pre-lapsarian state of grace. So we had all better get used to and adapt to the current situation or something very much like it. And this is where I quarrel with the choice of the word crisis, which many commentators have used to describe globalization's current situation. As I pointed at the beginning, crisis implies that there can be some sort of resolution. But the current state of globalization is, I think, a systemic condition, and it's a fool's errand to look for some de definitive resolution to it. There are many problems not just international problems, but in life that cannot be solved, only managed. And the sooner we recognize this, this harsh fact and abandon quixotic searches for easy solutions, the better. My second conclusion is that while the open international order, globalization 
is going to remain under stress and it will partially fragment and turn inwards in some domains, it is unlikely to collapse entirely. The most extreme form of collapse war is not merely unlikely, but highly improbable. The open globalization that we used to enjoy was driven by two key factors, politics and technology. The political conditions, whether in the domestic politics of key countries or in international geopolitics will remain unfavorable for the foreseeable future. But the technologies that drove and still drive globalization cannot be unlearned and will move globalization forward, albeit at an uneven pace in different domains and in different countries. And finally, the future is not in some real or imagined universal multilateral order. I see very little prospect for meaningful reform of key international institutions or the creation of meaningful new institutions. To deal with a future of messy globalization, in which there is a persistent deficit of leadership and in which US-China strategic competition is a structural feature of international politics, ad hoc, domain-specific and fluid coalitions of countries with compatible interests will coalesce around specific issues in specific domains. Such coalitions will continually arrange and rearrange themselves in very graded patterns in different domains as interests and circumstances change. These coalitions will exist as an overlay to existing international institutions and modify the way in, in which they function. They will span geographic regions crossing and crisscrossing the axis of US-China strategic competition. And compatibility of, compatibility of interest in one domain does not imply any obligation to align interests across all domains as it did during the US-Soviet Cold War. Now, to successfully navigate such a future will require great agility of mind and policy and domestic institutions capable of quick adaptation. And on that note, I will end. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kasi Khan. Um, thank you very much for your very insightful and also thought-provoking uh, keynote address. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to um, open the floor for the Q&A session and let me uh, announce uh, how this works. Uh, so um, the participants, please use the raised hands uh, function on your Zoom. You can find your hand icon at the bottom of your screen. And uh, if you press it, we will be uh, able to notify uh, that and then uh, we'll able to uh, point on you so that you can speak. You can also if, use the Q&A function. Uh, could you also turn your video, your video? I find it disconcerting to speak into a disembodied voice. Uh, sure. To... <laughs> sure. Can, can you see me now? I can see you, no. Okay, I'm good, talking good. about the audience. Okay, yes. I will um, ask them to turn on their video uh, if they can. Um, and also you can use the Q&A function uh, so that uh, they can pose a question if they want to remain anonymous. But uh, you are recommended to... Uh, to probably um, ask your questions in your own voice and also probably show your face if, if that is uh, okay with you. Uh, with that, I would like to open uh, the floor for questions. And we actually have one comment from uh, actually Ms. Yumi Araki-san, uh, which is about your comment on Washington, uh, DC. Uh, she says uh, you're forgiving and and agreed, uh, uh, Washington is not, uh, is the center of the universe, uh, she says. <laughs> um, if, Arak san would you like to make any comments about that? <laughs> if not, uh, while we are waiting for um, others, oh, we have a hand and thank you. Um, Jeremy San, would you like to kick off the Q&A session by your question? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Halsukan, for your talk. I wanted to ask what are your thoughts on the future role of Hong Kong in Asia, especially with the turmoil over the past year, um, and where Hong Kong's place in China would be uh, in the years to come? Hong Kong fate is settled. It's a Chinese city. It will remain a Chinese city. Its special status has proved inconvenient to the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party leadership for the obvious reasons. Uh, 
And uh, it's just going to become much more normal and subsumed in the greater Pearl River Delta area. It's over basically for Hong Kong. And, and I have to say it's very much the Hong Kong's own fault. Uh, one country, two systems is a nice slogan, but Beijing's emphasis was always on one country, not two systems. And that's the fundamental mistake the Hong Kong people made. It's sad, but that's fa a fact, that's reality. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a hand from Dean uh, Merit Juno. Um, I will um, upgrade you as a panelist. So if you could join via video and also unmute yourself, that would be great. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you for those uh, wonderful remarks. I find very little I disagree with uh, and it was very, very eloquent. I'm wondering what you think uh, is the path forward in US-China relations. If you imagine this structural um, tension as inevitable, which I do, uh, you may have heard um, the recent speech by uh, the Secretary of State in which he was saying that, you know, we should find ways to cooperate where we can, even as uh, there will be this tension. Uh, where do you think that pathway lies uh, with today's China? Well, first of all, let me say, I think competition in international relations of some degree is the normal state of affairs. Right? for all the reasons I think you know, and I don't need to repla replace that. Uh, what we can hope for, and I think what is going to evolve, but not in the near term, right, is a much more stable competition. So compete because that's the natural state of affairs, and there may be even periods of confrontation, uh, but cooperate when you can in certain issues. Now, why do I say that I don't think this is going to, um, uh, this, this kind of stability is going to be achieved anytime soon. Because for now, I think on both sides, both the US side and the Chinese side, the, the primary considerations are domestic and neither wants to appear weak. For China, in July this year, the Chinese Communist Party is going to um, celebrate its 100th anniversary. And next year, 2021, is the crucial 20th Party Congress where Mr. C is, I think, going to seek a third term. He has already in a principle or abolished the term limits and he's going to seek a third term. Now it's quite clear to me that he has made serious mistakes, including mishandled US-China relations, right? And it's not really clear to me what I think is beside the point, but I think it's clear to people in the Chinese Communist Party, so he wouldn't want to appear weak. On the other hand, Mr. Biden's priorities and this correct priority is domestic. Because if you're going to play a serious international role, it has to be built on a, on a solid domestic base. That's true of any country, but it's certainly true of a superpower like, like the US. And as I mentioned, there are 74 million people who voted for Mr. Trump and they won't vanish. And he needs the, his, the Democrats' um, majorities or margins in both the Senate and the House are paper thin. And he needs the cooperation of Republicans and every Republican in Congress, or at least most of them, whether in the Senate or the House, is going to be looking to those 74 million people for their re-election. So he has, he too doesn't want to appear weak. And in fact, relations with China is one of the few issues in which I can see, and I've been looking at the US and, and dealing with the US for almost 40 years, that there is a bipartisan consensus. So the immediate prognosis is more of the same, perhaps, Mr. Biden is going to make policy and communicate it in a more traditional way, shall we say. And he's going to try to work um, better in a more consultative way with friends and allies. And that's all to the good. But don't forget, as I said, the priorities are domestic and working with friends and allies is a form of burden sharing because the US clearly cannot do everything by itself anymore. So the immediate prognosis is not good. It's more of the same, perhaps at a lower level of tension, at least hopefully so. Uh, but the longer term, we can hope for stability in competition, order in competition, if that's not a contradiction in terms. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, now we have a uh, hand by Professor Osi. Osi Sensei, please. Yes. Um, uh, Ambassador Kalsigan, thank you very much for um, your, your speech. And I think uh, you articulated very well some of the criticalities of the current landscape in international relations. And also, um, I was very much fascinated by what you said, uh, what you said about the Western world, the United, the United States, but also the European Union. Um, so my impression is that, uh, well, I, I work with ideas, essentially, my specialization is in history of political thought. And what I kind of notice in the past decades is that uh, we have an increasing ideologization of the landscape in the Western world, which is uh, a little bit paradoxical because um, so after the end of the Cold War, there was this idea that ideology is, is kind of dead. And uh, you remember, of course, um, the argument by uh, Francis Fukuyama, the end of history, ideology is no longer an issue. And the other uh, counter argument was uh, the um, clash of civilization um, by um, Esam mm -hmm. Hantito. Uh, but paradoxically, now we have, my impression is that the Western world is becoming incredibly ideological. So when I go to the Western world, it seems that you must believe and media and all kinds of, and everything is getting very politicized and ideologized. So sports event, commercials, uh, movies, everything is super ideologized. And that doesn't really help in terms of depolarization of the society. So there's a lot of talk about polarization in the society, but then the same people who talk about de-escalating the polarization are actually working for more polarization by politicizing pretty much everything. Um, and... Um, so how do we get out of this? So what kind of ideas could be useful um, to, to, to take a step back, depoliticize or create spaces for not so controversial parts of society? Well, first of all, I think I disagree with you one point. Hmm? The West has always been ideological. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, as ideological as the Soviet bloc, and perhaps in some ways even more so. It was so ideological, they did not even realize that they were propounding an ideology. Take Francis Fukuka, Fuku, Fukuyama, right? The end of history is a profoundly ideological thought. True. <laughs> it has its parallel in communism, which also predicted the end of history. <laughs> right? It, it stems from the same, I mean, I don't want to get into it. I think you know better than I. It stems from the same enlightenment roots. Right. Uh, so the West has always been ideological, far more ideological uh, than, or as ideological at least, than the Soviet Union or China today. Uh, the class of civilizations was another ideology. Right? So I don't see anything new. How do we get out of it? I don't think so, because uh, this is a cast of mind that is deeply embedded in the whole mode of thinking that characterizes what we call, rather simplistically, the West, with a capital W. Right? Uh, as far as the European Union is concerned, I think um, the fundamental mistake the European Union did is to think of Europe as a supranational entity. To think that nationalism, which is the most powerful ideology affecting all kinds of political systems, has been the most powerful and enduring ideology since the 19th century. And it's gaining force, not losing force. This is not necessarily a bad thing, but it has to be accepted as a fundamental part of human nature. The European Union worked fine until it overreached itself. And the, the fundamental mistake was Schengen, I think. Hmm. Okay? Uh, now, I used to tease some European friends by saying that, you know, when they were at the height of this, um, how do I say, the European high in the immediate post-Cold War, I used to tell them, you know, you, this thing about trying to get to create a new European that is not a Spanish, Spaniard or a Frenchman or a German or Portuguese or, or Romanian or whatever, it reminds me of the Soviet Union that tried to create a new Soviet man, right? And the minute, the day after the Soviet Union collapsed, suddenly everybody found that he was Russian or, or Ukrainian or Kazakh or Belarusian again. And, and, it, and this happened in the European Union. 
the minute there was a crisis, and you had you see it now, over the squabble, rather unseemly squabble over vaccines. Everybody suddenly remembers I'm Portuguese, I'm Italian, I'm something. So you have to work. Any political project that works against human nature is bound to fail. It's not so much the ideology, because we can't help but have ideologies. You know, it's part of human nature to try to simplify a very complex reality by putting it into frameworks. that We can either do it consciously or unconsciously, but we do it. But it's uh, being conscious that you are doing it and to the extent possible mitigating it and working out pragmatic, practical solutions that is going to bring us forward. It's not replacing one set of ideas with another because if we are not conscious that all ideas have their limitations, we will end up by a different route maybe in the same place. Thank you very much for your very thorough answer. I, 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 I kind of agree with you, uh, definitely on many of your points. Uh, but today in the West, there's a lot of people who'd say, including many people in academia, that there is no such thing as human nature. How do you respond to that? I say that you should get real and stop. You know, Adam Smith said that the learner ignore the evidence of their senses in order to preserve the coherence of the ideas of their imagination. I would enjoin them to think of that and remember it and look around, get real and look around rather than imagine things. There are human natures, that's true. There's not one human nature, there are human natures, but it is still human nature. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we would like to turn to uh, Norman Tan, uh, who I will um, ask you to turn on your video and also unmute yourself when you ask the question. Uh, Norman Tan from GRASP. Uh, Norman Tan, can you... Yes, thank you. Uh, very yes, much. Right, um, thank you, Ambassador Kosigan, for their very uh, intellectually stimulating sharing. Uh, my question is quite simple. It's about middle powers. So, as if, as you said, uh, if the US and China global superpowers are preoccupied with domestic concerns, is there room for middle powers like Japan, uh, India, and nowadays some would argue Vietnam to do the heavy lifting to advance international cooperation and also continue to develop multilateralism? Uh, the short answer is there is some room, but much less than the middle powers themselves may fondly believe. Japan plays a very important, but Japan since Mr. Abe's second term has played a very important role in supplementing what the US can no longer do itself in uh, what we now call the Indo-Pacific. And ditto for Vietnam, ditto for India, ditto for Australia, and so on. But I think uh, they do not have the strategic weight or the global reach to entirely replace, even in combination, uh, what the US or China can. Uh, China is in a more difficult position than the US because it has very little allies. Who can China really rely on in the world if it looks around? It, maybe Cambodia, maybe Pakistan, maybe North Korea, and I don't think even North Korea. North Korea, I know for a fact, has no love for the Chinese. This is not a good situation. Uh, the US is in a slightly better situation because it has a, a number of allies of like mind, uh, or at least in part, not wholly like mind. Even Japan is not totally of like mind with the US, but it's in a better situation. But there is a reason why we call some powers superpowers or global powers and some powers middle powers. So they can supplement, but they cannot replace, even work uh, in combination. So that's why I think we are going to have a deficit of global leadership for quite some time to come. Thank you very much for that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have an anonymous person asking the question uh, using the Q&A function. Um, let me read it out uh, for you. Um, it says, thank you for your insights. We are seeing Biden administration is focusing on human rights issue, be it uh, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, more recently, Tibet. Do you see these issue becoming trigger, uh, becoming a trigger in U.S.-China relationships, or it is just an attempt to move pieces at the center of the chessboard? That is the question. Can you address to this question, Ambassador? Uh, 
Yes, certainly. I mean, I the short answer is in international relations, in geopolitics, human rights is an instrument. It's not an end in itself. It has always been so, it will always remain so. Hong Kong is a done deal. There's nothing that anybody can do about Hong Kong, frankly. The ditto for Tibet. Xinjiang is a slightly different issue because I think the Chinese have fundamentally miscalculated. Hong Kong is now part of China. It's been part of China since 1997. Tibet has very little external support. It has a little bit from India, but India is also using it as an instrument in its relationship with China. But Xinjiang is connected to the global Muslim Umrah, the global Muslim community. They are not very seized with Xinjiang right now, but they are growing increasingly aware. This is my own experience before we all couldn't travel anymore. I was traveling quite intensively in Central Asia. Uh, and I have traveled in the Middle East. And of course, the largest Muslim community in the world is in Southeast Asia where I live. There is great growing awareness. And I've told my Chinese friends, quoting Mao Zedong to them, you have made a mistake. A single spark can light a prairie fire. The grass is certainly dry. And if you are lucky, maybe the spark will never come. But it may come even as we speak or it may come next week or next year or in five years time, but it's all of your own doing because how can you sinicize a universal religion? This is a, it's an oxymoron and you're only storing up trouble for yourself. So Xinjiang, I would say is a little bit different than Hong Kong or Tibet because those are done deals. Nobody's going to do anything useful about that. Hong Kong, Xinjiang can take off on of, of itself. Now, this is not to say that it's going to be an instrument of policy for the Biden administration or any other administration. But every administration, every country uses human rights as an instrument of foreign policy, not as an end in itself. Not always as an end in itself, I should say. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have um, a hand from uh, the audience, uh, Bill Chen. Um, I will ask you to uh, be on for the video and also unmute your microphone. Bill Chen, can you um, unmute yourself and also put on your video? Yes. Yes, we can hear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Good morning. Yes, I can hear you. Uh -oh. Hello. Okay. Yeah, I can see and hear you. Please ask your question. Uh, sorry, I'm doing some I don't have specific question, but for the uh, globalization, do you think the trend in the foreseeable future, what would it be? I, I don't understand your question. Sorry, could you rephrase uh, it? You know, the Chinese government uh, upholds the principle of opening up and uh, multilateralism and globalization, but the trend seems um, a little bit changed over the couple of, over the past few years. And how do you foresee the future in the next few years? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure I have a good answer, but it's a good question. I think one of the most profound single decisions any country has made was Mr. Teng Xiaoping's decision uh, almost 30 years ago to reform and open up, right? It yeah. takes a very special kind of person to look at his life work, decide it's going wrong, and suddenly change direction. Right? And that could only happen in a, in a system like China, because otherwise there will be too much debate and, and so on, right? Yeah. But now I think China is reaching an inflection point. And as I said in my opening remarks, the Chinese Communist Party itself has recognized that the, the growth model that took it through the 90s and early 2000s, with the spectacular results that we all know, is, is not sustainable over long run and you need a new growth model. And, in, and this is in 2012, the, the 18th Party Congress. 
The next year at the party plenum in 2013, they rolled out the outlines at least of a new growth model, which at its core, and I'm simplifying a little bit, but at its core was to give a decisive role, and this was the exact words we used, for the market in the allocation of resources. Very little has been implemented of that, mainly in the financial area, not in the real economy, uh, because it poses a fundamental dilemma. People outside China forget one simple fact about China. China is a communist country, one of five remaining left in the world. Not in its ideology, of course. I think it's been a long time since anybody in China really took, say, class struggle seriously, but certainly in the structure of its political system. It is the Chinese Communist Party is a Leninist vanguard party that claims a monopoly of power and control over all sectors of society. And Mr. Xi Jinping has insisted much more strongly since he came to power on party discipline, party control, including, as I mentioned, over private enterprises. And he is not illogical to do so because under Hu Jintao, there was growing disillusionment in China over the Communist Party, primarily because of corruption. Right? He recognized the problem, he did something about it, and he has insisted much more strongly on party discipline. But control is the opposite, the diametric opposite of market. Market, by definition, means less control. Now, the choice is not absolute. It's how much control you give up to have how much more market efficiency. So it's a new balance rather than an absolute choice. But they have not decided, to my mind. They have not decided because they don't want to take the risk of losing control. In fact, Mr. C has gone the other way in a, to a large extent. You see what happened to uh, Jack Ma and all the big tech companies. And in fact, it's not just uh, Alibaba and, and, and. He's emphasizing control much more and it's not illogical for him to do so because frankly, I see no alternative to Communist Party rule for China because all the alternatives are not practical and may re result in worse outcomes. But it does create this fundamental dilemma, which I don't mean to say that China is going to collapse or anything like that because the Communist Party is a very adaptable organization, but it is circling around rather than confronting the essential problem. And that's why it cannot be a leader of globalization. To lead an open world, you have to yourself to be open. How did America lead? It's part of the world, right? It lead by basically opening up its economy and allowing others to attach themselves to it, including China, by the way. Now, China can only do that to a limited extent without losing control or risking control. So that's why we are again in back in this fundamental point I'm making. This is very largely a leaderless world and we'll have to learn to live with it. Thank you. Well, thank you very oh, one much. One more point, one more point. Sorry, Mr. Sure. Chen. You know, when Mr. Xi Jinping talks, goes to Davos and other places and talks about the importance of globalization, he's really expressing the same concerns uh, as many other countries because the main benefit of American-led glo globalization in those years between 1989 and around, say, 2008, was China. And if that open world falters, China, who was the main beneficiary, could be one of the main losers too. You know, all that Chinese have achieved, which is real, which is admirable, is built on that foundation. All any of us have achieved. Japan, Singapore, you know, South Korea, China, is built on that foundation of the globalized international order. And if there's no leader, it's not going to collapse that order, but it's going to be dysfunctional, it's going to be under stress. And China will be affected no less than anybody else. Can the Belt and Road succeed, for example, if the world turns protectionist? I don't think so. Uh, 
Okay, just one short comment. As yeah. uh, with regards to your comment that uh, the party control or discipline, I think there's pros and cons. For example, in the pandemic control and prevention, you know, I think uh, many people will agree that China do a, does a well. job, a good job, yeah, compared with other countries like the US or some many, many European countries. And, you know, the steady growth of economic and on one hand, and on the other hand, the pandemic control and prevention. So I think that this is also the, uh, the, the, you know, the strength of the, the system in China right now. No, I don't disagree with you, but don't forget about the crucial delay of about five days to a week that allowed the pandemic to break the bounds of Wuhan and break the bounds of China and become a global pandemic. That also can be attributed to the characteristics of a communist system. Now, you may or may not agree, but you know, I think there's quite a lot of evidence that it was a crucial delay. Even the mayor of Wuhan, when he was criticized by saying, why didn't you alert everybody? Said basically said something, in fact, I had to get permission from Beijing first. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to move on to the next uh, question. Uh, Dean Danny Quad, thank you very much for your patience. Um, you have the floor. Hi, thank Danny. You. Hi, Bill Harry. Good to see you. Good morning. Uh, can I build on one of the themes of the, in, your, in your presentation? At the risk of... Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you fine. Thanks. Okay, at the risk of maybe you know, being a little bit oversimplifying, one of the themes is uh, that there are no permanent friends or allies, only permanent interests on the part of sovereign, sovereign nations. And what you describe as our going towards is not a fixed order of alliances, but perhaps you know, a fluid marketplace, a bazaar almost. Uh, people bringing different ideas, concerns onto the table and then forming into smaller groups, smaller coalitions that try to find solutions. And building on that theme, I wonder if that might also have been the case at the height of the liberal international order, because it's difficult to see sovereign doing sovereign nations doing anything but pursue their self-interest. It just so happened that at that time, there was an observational equivalence between being self-interested and being in the organized liberal rules-based international system. That leads me to my question for you. One large function of a more or less organized international system, whether spontaneous or officially organized, is to solve global public goods problems. Problems that the entire community has to come to because these are problems without passports. Organization is good for solving global public goods problems, not so good at individual self-interest challenges. So is it your view that moving forwards from today, global public goods problems are no longer so visible, so prominent, or so real? Thank you very much. No, it's not my view. I think they are even more prominent and more visible if you take, for example, think of climate change, right? Uh, it's a much more visible and uh, an urgent problem than any others in, in recent history, right? But, but whether something's going to be done about it, that's another matter, right? Now, you are right that, you know, uh, this is how states organize themselves since time immemorial. It was a little easier during two periods. It was a little easier, which not to say that it's easy, but it's a little easier, in, you know, it's a relative term, during the Cold War because there were two clear camps. It was a little easier too during that short and what I described as a short and exceptional period between 1989 and circa 2008, 2009, right? Because there was no other alternative actually, right? Now there appears to be an alternative, but it's not an alternative as clear cut as that between the US and Soviet Union. Because as I said, China and U US are in one system. And, they, and that system requires both of them to work together. And just, but just because there is a problem doesn't mean there's going to be a solution. And that also uh, applies to global public goods. Ideally, this is uh, climate change. Let's use climate change as a, because it's such a stark example that is a good example. 
Ideally, you know, you should work together in some international organization, either existing or you can create one to deal with this problem because it's clear that this is not a problem that any country or even groups or countries can solve by itself, right? But will it happen? No. Why? Because all the international organizations are not supranational organizations and cannot be. They are international organizations. So therefore, even if we recognize a common problem, we will place different emphasis on it. We'll have slightly different definitions of it and so on. And it's going to be difficult. It's a good thing, for example, that the US has come back to the Paris Accords. But the Paris Accords, even if it is going to be fully implemented, which is by no means to be taken for granted, in fact, we can take it for granted, it's largely not going to be fully implemented, uh, is going to be, it's going to have only a minor effect on the overall problem of you know, carbon emissions. But it's better that they are in it together rather than you know, going their own way. But we, so we have to be realistic. International organizations are not a panacea for anything. They have their limitations. They can only exist by, exi by... in the beginning, somebody asked a question, not to me, but to uh, um, Araki-san, uh, about the role of non-governmental or actors, corporations, and so on. They clearly have a role. In that sense, the international system has changed. But the balance of power is still with state actors. If a, a corporation, let's say, uh, a, a corporation falls, gets into some kind of a quarrel with a state actor, its only recourse really is to go through another state actor. Right? They can't act by themselves. They are not sovereign. That still matters. And don't forget, all international organizations are collections of sovereign states and they will have, even if they recognize a common problem, they will have slightly different definitions of it, slightly different solutions to it, and so on. And don't forget, uh, a, a, issue, a, a global common good, most global public goods are problems of a very peculiar kind. And climate change is again the archetypical example. There are problems where you pay the cost up front and you reap the benefits way down in the future. And for any electoral system, that's a losing proposition, you know. Any, right? So these are real problems that we have to take into account. I'm not preaching a council of despair, I'm preaching a council of realism as we try to grapple with these problems. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to ask uh, Professor Yoshihiro Kawai uh, to speak. Yes. Thank you, Ambassador. Just to very, uh, just following what you have argued, uh, just I want to know a little bit more about this leaderless uh, one system, global one system, uh, particularly in relation to China. And not on, not in the near future, let's say uh, two, three years in the future, but more a little bit long term, like 10, 20, particularly 20 years in the future. Could you tell us your view of this, you know, China gaining more and more power uh, globally, but not a leader? And what would happen in the 20 years in the global community in one system? Could you well, tell I think us? China's rise is a geopolitical fact, right? Yeah. And that uh, implies a relative redistribution of power in the global system. Mm. Uh, it's therefore going to be more, much more, but you know, I mean, China's rise means a relative diminution of power of the US, of the EU, of Japan, of South Korea, Australia, et cetera, et cetera, right? You know this, right? What it means is it's going to get, be more and more difficult to get coordination on many international issues. What Danny uh, just mentioned, global public goods, whether it is climate change or nuclear proliferation, or, or you name it, it's going to be very much difficult to get more coordination. That's a fact of life because different countries are going to have different definitions. But the big difference is that unlike the Soviet Union and the US, China and the US are part of one system. They are both vital parts of the, the, the current global system. And they compete within the system rather than between two systems, right? Uh, both the US and China are 
if I may simplify it a bit, mixed economies. Right? Uh, there is planning in the US too. They don't call it planning. They call it regulation. <laughs> right? There's planning in uh, Western market economies. They don't call it planning. They do in some European countries, but they call it regulation. It's the same thing, but a different, a different instrument to the same means. There's no pure laissez-faire economy anywhere. There's no planned economy anywhere, right? right? So they are all one system and, and they have to work together, but it's not meaning, does not mean that they can easily work together. In fact, it's going to be very difficult for them to work together because there are other differences of interest. And, and that's why I said, I don't like the word to call crisis to describe globalization. Crisis implies that there will be a resolution. One way or another, a crisis must end, <laughs> you know? A patient, when you say a patient, this illness has reached a crisis, it means either the patient will get better or he will die. But this is a chronic condition. It will go on like this for a long time. That is what I mean by uh, a long-term problem. And China is part of the problem. China is part of the solution. US is part of the problem. The US is part of the solution. Ditto, Japan, India, Australia, Singapore, everybody. <laughs> Just to follow up uh, com uh, questions, you know, uh, currently uh, US, China or uh, China and the other part of the world is balanced, but in the in future, like 10, 20 years, China's relative power and the economics uh, dominance is much bigger than, than the current world. So just, I want to know a little bit more about, you know, this uncertainty is, uh, is definitely there, but you know, this China's uh, power in the global domain, how is it like in the future? You know, but it's, of course, it is obviously going to get. You no, know, first of all, let's say uh, there's no country in the world in history that has ever grown on a smooth trajectory, and I don't think China is going to be an exception. Mm -hmm. I mentioned one fundamental problem that China faces. There are others, you know. I mean, that fundamental problem of finding a new balance between political control and market efficiency is the core problem. But there are many subsets of that problem. In China, so it's not going to be a smooth trajectory. But that said, China will grow. It will become more powerful in all dimensions of power. But that does, and but those changes are relative, not absolute. The U.S. is not going to disappear. Japan is not going to disappear. India is growing slowly, but it's still growing, etc. It will be a much messier world in which power, the power equation, is going to be much more dispersed. Mm -hmm. Right, but don't forget, China has one very serious liability. Right? I mentioned it briefly in the beginning. Look, the U.S. has friends and allies. The interests of the U.S. and Japan, the U.S. and Korea, the U.S. and Australia. These are allies. U.S. and the EU or NATO. They are not identical, but they are very much more or less in the same ballpark. Where is China's allies? North Korea, actually no, North Korea distrusts China as much as it distrusts the US. I've been there many times and they have told me so. Mm -hmm. Cambodia, is it a big deal? Pakistan, even there, there are lots of tensions. So China is in a disadvantageous position. I think China, towards the end of the Hu Jintao era, made an error which has been compounded by Mr. Xi Jinping. It's a strategic error. And the error is to prematurely abandon Deng Xiaoping's policy of hiding your capabilities and biding your time. I think he prematurely re revealed his capabilities and ambitions. And that has caused a global backlash. Tell me one major economy that does not have a problems with China. Just in the economic sphere. They all have more or less the same problems. Uh, and, and that's a very un strategically unfavorable position to be in. So China's rise is real. We must acknowledge it. But China is not 10 feet tall. It is not invincible. It is a country like any other country. It is a big power like every other big power. And we will have to deal with it in that way. It's not special. Neither is the US special. This idea of exceptionalism of America, China, and all that, this is a myth that these countries like to believe in because everybody has to believe in something. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, next, I would like to ask uh, Dean Ohashi to speak.
Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Kostin, uh, for your experience and, and very insightful analysis of why globalization didn't work so far. And, you know, I fully concur that, you know, prog prog pragmatic approach, you know, may be a way forward. And especially, you know, we, you know, subset of countries actually share common interests, for example, you know, maritime waste yeah. and so forth. And in my experience in the, in the past, you know, more than 10 years ago, you know, I worked, you know, I, I helped, you know, on the trilateral aviation liberalization across three countries, you know, the China, Korea, and Japan. Okay, and local aviation, yeah, at the time, you know, three countries have not really a good relationship at the time, but local mm -hmm. aviation authorities all agree that, you know, we should move, move toward fifth freedom of aviation. Yeah. And we, we actually, you know, proceed up to a very good relation but suddenly the, the negotiation stopped because of China. Yeah. So even the programmatic approach, you know, local authorities or, you know, people all agreed, you know, sometimes it's very difficult because central government actually get hold of local stuff. Do, do you have yeah. any views on, you know, how no, pragmatic approach could move forward? No, no pragmatic approach is not uh, a silver bullet either, you know. <laughs> there are limitations to every approach, right? This is the human condition, you know. We yep. live on earth, uh, not in heaven, right? So there are always limitations to everything. Some things will work, some things will not work. Some things will work for a while and then they will stop working. Some things may not work and then after a while they may work for a while. You no, know, this is life, you know. This is uh, international relations, the management of international relations is in a way a constant process of adap adaptation. Mm -hmm. There's no silver bullet solution to anything. I don't believe so anyway. That's not my experience. Uh, and in fact, looking for silver bullet sol solutions can sometimes be very harmful. <laughs> I see, I see. We should keep going. Yeah, just Thank keep you. going. Because you've got no choice. You have to live, right? You have to right. believe in this world. So you just keep going. Sometimes you can't do anything. That we also have to accept. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, next, I would like to ask uh, Norman Tan to speak. Um, this is your second question. Yes, um, thank you, Kojaro, for thank giving you. me another chance to ask a question. So, uh, Ambassador, I wanted to press you a bit further on the point you made earlier about Xinjiang and how it's not a done deal as compared to t Tibet and Hong Kong. I also wanted to hear a bit more of your views about um, how how, how most Muslim countries can cooperate or actually press China. Because like my my impression, my humble impression was that being connected to Muslim countries, you know, for the Uyghurs, it doesn't really matter. If anything, they are most connected to most of the Uyghurs are people of Turkic origin. They are most connected to Turkey, and I'm not sure whether Turkey has the political will to press China unless there is like some sort of gain for them in their you know, house of cards. Of, Europe and the US. And so also the Muslim hard. countries have not really been a sterling example of being able to agree with anything. And like we have Saudi Arabia trying to oh you have Saudi Arabia openly supporting China's Xinjiang policy. And if you look at the Rohingyas in Myanmar, like nothing much has been done. In fact, I think Malaysia has been trying to expel them from the country and that has received some political support. So how would you respond to these challenges? Well, I think you're right because you know it's but there is a, a somewhat, big, the big difference is the global Umrah. I know of no Muslim, no government, any Muslim uh, majority country that is uh, very eager to take up the cause of the Yugas. But that was the case. If you think back, if you think back to, uh, let's say, uh, the Salman Rushdie case or the Danish cartoon case, where at that time too, there was no government of a Muslim country, particularly in the Danish cartoon case, that was very eager to make an issue of this against Denmark, a small country, right? However, the people forced them. Suddenly, the thing caught fire. Right now, it's not fire, but it is. there is an awareness in the Muslim world. In Central Asia in particular, which I, which I have been traveling over the last few years, the people are not very happy with China over this. The governments want to work with China, so they try to suppress this, right? But it is there. This is what I meant when I quote Mao Zedong to my Chinese friends, a single spark can start the prairie fire. The grass is dry. Now that spark may come, it may not come. If the Chinese are lucky, it may never come, right? 
But what? But it may come tomorrow. It may come in five years' time. It may come next week. In other words, it's a sword of Democles hanging over them, which they have created themselves because I've told my Chinese friends, if you had kept this problem as one of a few terrorists committing acts of terror in China, right, in the name of uh, Uyghur nationalism, everybody will be on your side. There will be no problem, you know, because terrorism is a universal problem. But you have widened the issue. You are now trying to universalize a universal, uh, a Sinicize a universal religion. It's not just a Yugas, it is the Hui, right? Which were the ideal Muslims in China for a long time. Now they are feeling the pressure too because they are trying to put the, force them all into one more. And that I cannot see how it will work. No, I'm not saying this thing is going to be a problem tomorrow. Uh, but it, and it may never be a problem, but it could be a problem at any time. And this is all a self created problem. That's all I'm saying. And this is very different from Tibet and from Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a done deal. It's over. Nobody can do anything about it. Nobody, people may grumble now and then, but you know, it's, it's, of, it's of no consequence, right? Um, Tibet is a little bit more complicated, but there is no big state actor supporting, there, or no big population outside Tibet and a bit of India supporting the Tibetan cause. But there is a global Muslim Umrah, which can be mobilized uh, because that's the grass that could catch fire from a single spark. And that's a very precarious position to be. And it was an avoidable position, but now it's too late. It's always going to be a potential vulnerability. All right, thank you very much for that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, an anonymous uh, person asking the question using the Q&A function. And uh, the first one is a short one. We have two. So maybe yeah. I will read out the two questions. And then if you could address uh, the two questions at the same time, Ambassador, that would be great. Okay. Uh, the first question is, uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, you pointed out US is turning inward. If you were Japan or Korea, what would you do? This is the first question about Japan and Korea becoming inwards. Uh, the second question is, uh, do you see Myanmar providing opportunity to demonstrate cooperation between superpowers or an opportunity to extend sphere of influence? This is the second question about Myanmar. Uh, if you could address these questions, that'd be great. Okay, I'll take the first one uh, and then I'll go on to the second one, right? I didn't, first of all, I didn't say the US is turning inwards. I said the U.S. priorities are domestic. That's not quite the same thing, you know, right? But yes, they will have less time and attention and resource to, to deal with uh, international issues. And it will require its allies like Japan and Korea to step up and, and uh, you know, take up the slack that it, 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 it cannot do itself. To a very large extent, uh, Japan under Mr. Abe's second administration has done so, right? And that's a good thing, I think. Korea less so, because Korea, quite understandably, is much more focused on uh, its great brother to the north, <laughs> right? But I think that that would be the expectation of all US friends and allies. And in that sense, uh, Mr. Biden is going to be just like Mr. Trump. He, Mr. Biden will be much more polite than Mr. Trump. He'll be much more consultative than Mr. Trump, but the direction is going to be the same, burden cherry by another name, all right? Myanmar is an interesting case. Let's start from very hard fact. The hard fact is that nobody has much leverage over Myanmar, right? The Myanmar military is the most important political force in Myanmar since 1948, when they first got their independence. And no matter how this particular crisis ends, the Myanmar military will remain the most important political force in Myanmar. Right? One, uh, some of the responsibility must go to Ms. Ong Hang Suu Kyi. She, did, she knows very well the importance of the Myanmar military, but she was far too uncompromising. The problem with Myanmar is that both Ong Hang Suu Kyi and the military are very much alike. They are both very stubborn. They both feel entitled to power. And the tragedy is both have got a good case to make for the entitlement to power, but they could not work together. And therefore, we are as we are. Will this benefit one side or another? I don't think so, 
I don't think the Chinese are overjoyed at seeing what's happening in Myanmar. Mar their relationship with the Myanmar military has always been a difficult one, even in the previous period of military rule. Right? Why? The Myanmar military is deeply distrustful of China. Do not forget that Myanmar military has been in continuous combat for almost 70 years, fighting against ethnic insurgencies and at one time the Burmese Communist Party insurgencies, all of which were supported by China. They are not trustful of China. Right? But if you give them no choice, they will have to work with China. That was the mistake many Western countries made during the previous period of military rule. They imposed blanket sanctions on the military. They tried to, to isolate the military. Myanmar can never be totally isolated. It always will have a huge back door to China and a side door to India. Neither will ASEAN countries, and I think Japan too, ever completely isolate Myanmar. It's not in our interest and we won't do it. Right? There's a better understanding of that in the West now. Right Now, but if you give Myanmar no choice, it will move to China, however reluctantly. One of the reasons the Myanmar military a few years ago experimented with a certain form of constitutional rule is to broaden its international options beyond China. Right? However, that is a secondary consideration to maintaining power and centrality in the Myanmar political system. This is the hard fact. And that's where we are. And nobody has much influence over Myanmar, the Myanmar military. The only people who can change the minds of the Takmador, as the military calls itself, generals, are other Takmador generals. Well, thank you very much for your insightful comments. Um, and uh, I learned about uh, a lot of Myanmar already, so thank you very much. And uh, next, uh, we also have two additional anonymous questions. And uh, probably um, while I read out these questions, if there's no other questions, these will be the last questions that we're go going to be mm -hmm. handling. So if you have any questions, please uh, do raise your hands or uh, raise it in the Q&A function as I read these questions. So there are two additional questions. The first one is, uh, and I read it, um, you pointed out, that Hong Kong will be integrated with China due to the fundamental system of one country, two systems. How do you view the situation with Taiwan and China? Will the result of Taiwan in the future be like Hong Kong or will there be a different result? This is the first questions about uh, Taiwan. And if I may, uh, the second question, thank you. The second question is, uh, what are your thoughts uh, on Thailand? Do you think it'll ever return to a full democracy? How do you think Thailand has managed, managed to escape heavy penalties for its previous coups, uh, unlike the backlash on Myanmar? And also, how have they still maintained stability despite these coups? Uh, these are the two questions. Okay, um, I think the situation in Taiwan and Hong Kong in broad terms is the same but in specific terms, it's very different. As I said, Hong Kong is a done deal. It was handed over back to China in 1997 and it's not going to be, and that is not going to be undone. So Hong Kong's future is of greater and greater integration into China proper. It will be just another Chinese city in due course. A pity, but that's the fact. Taiwan is generally recognized by everybody, at least in a formal sense, to be part of one China. But it's not so easy because nobody has handed over Taiwan and Taiwan is not about to hand over itself to China. I don't think up to recently China was, and I still think actually, despite all the, the fairly provocative moves that China has made in recent years, uh, there is a great hurry to reintegrate Taiwan. The great worry of China is that Taiwan declares itself independence. If that happens, there will be a war. I don't know whether the Chinese can win the war because the US and other countries will almost certainly be dragged into such a war. At least that's the calculation. But if Taiwan makes a dash for independence, the Chinese must fight because there is no Chinese government that can survive the definitively loss of Taiwan. 
as part of China. For since the, the well, more than 100 years, since 100 odd, odd years, since maybe the end of the Qing dynasty, the legitimacy of the Chinese, of every Chinese government of any kind of political coloration has been its ability to defend China's ter territorial integrity. So China cannot let Taiwan go. It is not maybe be in a hurry to reincorporate Taiwan because it would have to fight a war to do it and it's not eager to fight a war, but it cannot in principle let it go. Right? So that's the fundamental difference. If we look at all the flashpoints in East Asia, South China Sea, East China Sea, um, and ta Taiwan, Taiwan is the most dangerous. Right? Because things can get easily out of hand there. Now, Thailand, Thailand is a very interesting case. Taiwan, Thailand, the Thai political system was based on three legs, I would say, right? Uh, ever since 1932, when, when the absolute monarchy, Thai monarchy, was overthrown by a military coup and replaced by a constitutional monarchy. Uh, the three legs are as follows. One is, of course, the military, and more generally, the bureaucracy but the military being the most part, uh, most important part of the bureaucracy. Second, of course, the monarchy, which is a very important unifying symbol for Thailand. And thirdly, the Bangkok elite. These were the three legs of Thai political stability. And it kept Thailand together despite many coups, many, many bouts of uh, political instability, in, including in recent times. Then Mr. Thaksin was, elected, I forget how many years ago, in the early 2000s, All right? Mr. Thaksin is not a member of any of these three legs. He's extremely rich, but he's not the Bangkok elite. He's from the Northeast, uh, uh, Chiang Mai. Uh, and so he was never quite accepted by these three legs. So he decided to create a new political base by himself, for himself. Now don't forget, Thailand is an extremely feudalistic society, even to this day, huh? in its attitudes. Um, he created a, third, a, a fourth leg for himself by enfranchising the people of the Northeast, the rural people of the Northeast, which never really had a franchise. The general attitude of the military, the monarchy, and the Bangkok elite to the so people of the Northeast is, will be nice to you, you stay down on the farm and behave yourself. He mobilized them because he needed, not for, I don't think he had very idealistic or, or noble objectives, he just wanted to create a new political base. And that is the so-called red shirts, right? Which was seen by the, the normal triad as a threat to their dominance of the system. And that's why you had coups and, and several coups. They tried it the constitutional way, but Taksin kept winning all again and again, either he or his proxies. And I've told my Thai friends, this is a fool's game you're after because there's one simple fact. In any system, there are always going to be more poor people than rich people. And so if, in any electoral system, they're always going to win. And so they resorted to a coup and they manipulated the constitution. So, but what has, this has done is frozen the political conflict rather than solved it. And I have told my Thai friends, and I don't know why they, uh, but, but they're very reluctant to do, to, to do it. It's a very obvious solution. Bring these people in as the fourth leg <laughs> of the system. They don't have any real personal loyalty to Thaksin or what he stands for. They are just happy because they have been given a franchise before, where before they have no franchise. And once people have had a franchise, you can, you, can, you can intimidate them for a time, but they will never give up that hope of regaining the franchise. So this is a frozen conflict, not, a, um, not an open conflict. And it's there. I mean, it's, it's a potential source of instability in Southeast Asia, which is unfortunate. Why has the... Um, why has the, um, there been less international fuss about the Thai coup than before? Once upon a time, there have been so many Thai coups, I can't even remember how many, how many. Since 1932, I've lost count. I mean, somebody can, some scholar can sit down and count. There have been many. 
Many of them were during the Cold War where Thailand was a US ally. And the fact is the crews, as crews go, were fairly, I don't know, I'm trying to find the right word. I can't really find the right word. They were not so bloody. There has been bloodshed, but not as much. Whereas the potential for bloodshed in Myanmar, in, in 1988, something, almost 4,000 people were killed. 2007, at least 30 odd people were killed. Right now we have surpassed that and I do not, the potential for going beyond uh, approaching something like, you know, uh, a massive loss of blood is there in is there in Myanmar, which is not there in Thailand. That's the difference. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have uh, the last question from Professor Arima. Uh, we only have uh, five minutes or so left. So uh, if we could have a brief uh, uh, interaction, that would be great. Uh, Professor Arima, please. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. And sorry, I'm just standing from one side. But my question is about uh, the uh, one of the global public goods, uh, climate change, and uh, the ongoing debate about uh, border carbon adjustment measures uh, being discussed in the EU, and the US seems to be also interested in that. And do you think that uh, this sort of, how can I say, carbon border tax uh, could accelerate uh, the decarbonization at the global level or uh, further exacerbate uh, the trade war between developed and developing countries? I'm very much curious about the piece. Thank you. Well, the kind of global carbon tax, border carbon tax that the EU um, is discussing, uh, I, I must admit that I'm very skeptical about what its motivations really are, okay? <laughs> Is it to, to save the world or climate change or to save uh, European airline industries and other things, <laughs> all right? That is, that is a very fundamental question that I have never heard any good answer from the EU, okay? I think that has to be settled first before. Yes, I think we we'll all have to eventually accept some form of carbon taxing, all of us. But who goes first? For what reasons? That is the really difficult things about having, you know, to get... In theory, we should all work for the global commons. Yeah. And certain climate change is a global common. In practice, there are so many difficulties. I, I, I mentioned some of them when I was talking to Danny Kwa a moment ago. I don't know whether you were listening. And this is just another one. I am very skeptical about why the EU is trying to do this, okay? And I've ever, never heard any convincing answer from the EU that has led me to reduce my skepticism. I agree. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, that concludes our Q&A session. And if uh, Ambassador Kausikan, do you have any final remarks to, uh, to the participants, including the students? No, thank you all for uh, inviting me. Thank you all for listening patiently to me. And you had great questions. I'm not sure I had great answers, but you know, Thank you. And if you need the statistics asked, which I promised in my opening remarks, uh, you know, uh, email me through the organizers and I'll send them to you. Ditto, if you have any other questions, I will be happy to try to answer them. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, we actually have two anonymous questions uh, on Q&A functions, so um, we will try to connect uh, those questions to you. Send them uh, to me by, you send them to me by, by email and I'll try to answer them. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much again for your generosity and your time and also providing us very insightful uh, uh, speech and, and Q&A session. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you very much. And uh, in uh, closing this session, um, I will ask to, uh, would like to ask uh, Dean Ohashi to make his concluding uh, remarks for this session. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, time is running out, so you know I'm going to be quick. Uh, thank you very much for Araki San, uh, also uh, Ambassador, you know, Kostkan, you know, for uh, sharing your precious time with us. And you know, each talk is very stimulating. And especially, you know, uh, Ambassador, you know, you your profound analysis of globalization and local politics, you know, really makes sense, you know, for all of us. And and also Araki San, you know, I. It's it's nice to hear you your views on you know on your journalism when you're reporting uh, you know how globalization works and also it's you know I, most interesting part for me is you know your view of you know similarity and the differences of local and the U.S. newspapers. Anyway, uh, thank you very much and please give a big applause you know to two speakers and also thank you for the student participating in this session. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our session and I'm, we cannot see you, but I'm sure the audience are clapping their hands as well. So thank you very much uh, for the distinguished guest for, thank you very much.